Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Spotlight Talk presented by Historic Beverly. Today, we'll be discussing a collection of continental currency here at the Cabot House. It's important to understand the history of currency in the United States, so we're going to do a brief recap of that history to help us understand continental currency. Now, of course, we all know that prior to the American Revolution, the colonies were under the control of Great Britain. You might expect that the colonies would use the same legal tender as Great Britain, which at the time was gold and silver and known as a bimetallic system. Although these British coins did circulate in the colonies, there was a noticeable lack of money in the colonies. This was because the colonies had an unfavorable trade balance with Great Britain, meaning that the value of the goods being imported from England far exceeded the value of the goods that the colonies were actually exporting to Great Britain. Now this was because the colonies were sending raw materials back to Great Britain. With those raw materials, craftsmen in Great Britain were creating finished goods that were worth more. Because of this, most of the gold and silver that was in the colonies eventually ended up back in Great Britain to pay for those goods. Colonists also did not have access to specie through any domestic gold or silver. And specie is a term that denotes money in the form of a coin rather than a paper dollar. With the lack of British coin circulating in the colonies, the colonists used other units as money to keep the economy flourishing. The most commonly used coin in circulation at the time was the Spanish dollar, frequently known as pieces of eight. These coins, which came to the colonies via trade with Mexico and the West Indies, were the most frequently used form of legal tender in the colonies. However, these coins were often needed for payment for British accounts and thus were rarely used for transactions within the colonies. Seen here is a Spanish dollar dated to 1739 and minted in Mexico. One side we can see shows the crowned hemispheres of the world between pillars with banners. The other shows the crowned arms of Philip V of Spain, who was monarch at the time. Colonists began adopting other non-traditional forms of legal tender for intercolonial transactions. For example, in Massachusetts, from 1643 to 1660, wampum, which were small beads made from shells, served as legal tender. Great Britain did not approve of this practice and ended it in 1660. In the southern colonies, tobacco leaves served a very similar purpose. Another popular method of conducting business was via warehouse receipts. Now these served as promissory notes and recorded the value of products stored in a warehouse. Since the bearer of the receipt had a claim to the exact amount of products specified on it, these receipts could circulate like currency. The problem with this method of conducting transactions was that oftentimes the receipts were not easily dividable. So think of it this way, if you have a $10 bill and you need to purchase food worth $2, but the person you're buying from has no change, do you forego the food that you need to feed your family? Or do you tell them to keep the change even though it far outweighs the original price? That was an issue that the colonists were faced with when they tried to use receipts as currency. Another issue was that the supply of product in circulation at any time could fluctuate wildly, which of course affected the value of the products. And even yet another issue was present in the lack of an even exchange rate. And cash in the colonies was typically valued in pounds, shilling, shillings, and pence. However, a pound in Massachusetts might be valued differently than a pound was in Pennsylvania. Local colonial governments instead began using paper money, which came in two different varieties. The first was commodity-backed paper money. This is similar to the use of warehouse receipts. Essentially, the value of the paper money was directly tied to a convertible and specific amount of some asset, such as silver or gold. However, because silver and gold was lacking in the colonies, 
The colonists instead seemed to use a, com a commodity that they had in abundance, which was land. And in the 18th century, we see a rise in the establishment of land offices, whose purpose was to issue money that was backed by real estate. Colonists could take out loans using their land as collateral and would receive paper notes from the land office in return. These notes could then circulate in the local economy as currency. The second type of paper money was known as fiat money. And this is money that derives its value based solely on the faith in the issuing party, rather than on any concrete or measurable asset. In the 18th century, colonial governments issued this type of money. This type of money was popular in that it did not require an initial asset and it could easily circulate throughout the colonies because of it. The British government, however, recognizing the potential risks of accepting colonial paper currency, passed several currency acts in 1751, 1764, and in 1773 in an attempt to regulate colonial currency. The acts sought to protect British merchants and creditors from being paid in depreciated colonial currency. The act of 1751 restricted the use excuse me, the issue of paper money in New England. It allowed for it to be used as legal tender for public debt, such as paying colonial taxes, but not for private debt, such as paying a British merchant. The Act of 1764 extended these restrictions to colonies beyond New England, and also forbade the colonies from designating the money as legal tender. The Act of 1773 amended the previous Act and allowed the colonies to designate paper money as legal tender for use for public debt only, however. And this policy created tension between the colonies and Great Britain and was cited as a grievance by colonists during the buildup of tensions that ultimately led to the American Revolution. Now it is during the American Revolution that we are introduced to continental currency. Recognizing the enormous cost associated with fighting what seemed to be turning into a prolonged war, the Continental Congress knew that something had to be done. On June 22nd, 1775, the Continental Congress voted to issue $2 million in bills of credit, which became known as continental currency, or sometimes simply just continentals. Over the next five years, Congress authorized ever increasing amounts of this paper money to meet the urgent demands of American forces for food, clothing, pay for their soldiers, transportation, and every other sort of military equipment. And finally, the total near the end of 1779 reached an unprecedented amount of 241,552,750 dollars printed. The task of printing continental currency was given to Philadelphia printer Hall and Sellers. David Hall was a business partner of Benjamin Franklin. Hall met Franklin in 1744 when he became a professional in the 18th century printing business. He became the foreman of Benjamin Franklin's shop in 1746 and did all the editing and publishing of the Pennsylvania Gazette, the newspaper which Benjamin Franklin had started. Franklin made Hall an official partner in the business in 1748 so that he, Franklin, could move on to pursue other interests during his full retirement. Franklin officially sold his share of the printing business to Hall in February of 1766. And not long after, William Sellers joined the practice as a journeyman printer in May. Hall made Sellers a business partner eventually and the new firm of Hall and Sellers printed all of the official documents for the government of the province of Pennsylvania, including its paper money. The continental currency they printed was denominated in dollars ranging from one sixth of a dollar all the way up to $80 and included many odd denominations in between. Now at first, continental currency circulated fairly on par with the Spanish dollar, but that did change quickly and continentals began to depreciate badly, giving rise to the famous phrase, 
it's not worth a continental. A primary problem was that the monetary policy was not coordinated between Congress and the colonies. While Congress was authorizing the printing of continentals, the states were simultaneously issuing their own bills of credit and debt certificates to cover war expenses. And the sheer number of bills issued soon led to massive depreciation across the colonies. And at one point during the war, General Washington is even said to have remarked, a wagon load of currency cannot buy a wagon load of supplies. Another factor that contributed to the massive depreciation was the British. Recognizing an opportunity with the mass printing of currency underway in the colonies, the British began a campaign of essentially economic warfare by counterfeiting continentals on an extremely large scale. Their rationale behind this was simple. If Americans could not pay soldiers and could not purchase supplies, it would put the economy in shambles. By undermining the economy, the British would also be undermining the American Congress. And by undermining Congress, the hope was that Americans would lose faith in Congress and thus realize the war could not be won. Now, since New York was under British control for a majority of the war, it was there that most of this counterfeiting was done. It's important to remember that the many security measures and anti-counterfeit techniques we employ with currency today were not available to individuals during the American Revolution. Even though banknotes had um, signatures and handwritten serial numbers, these were really no effective deterrent as they were easily forged. And in addition, most of the continental currency that was printed by legitimate services was done on cheap, with little eye to quality paper. This made the process of counterfeiting much easier. And often the fake currency could be easily spotted because it was actually of a higher quality than the legitimate bills. The paper was usually a higher quality and the engraving was of a much higher quality on the professionally done counterfeits. Now the British used several methods for disseminating the fake currency into the economy. One way was they would find men who had deserted from the American troops and give them money to go back and spend within their community. Another less subtle method was that the British advertised in the New York Gazette that they were looking for people to disseminate counterfeit bills throughout the colony. The advertisements were so brazen that General Washington and Congress quickly became aware of what they were doing. The threat of fake currency meant that many people living in the colonies were simply not willing to sell goods in exchange for these continentals. And American troops often only had these continentals available to them to purchase supplies. This was in contrast to the British troops who had more desirable gold and silver specie available to pay the colonists for their goods. The biggest and most visible sign of how the counterfeiting was affecting the economy and the country at large was Congress actually passing a law that made counterfeiting a capital crime. Once that law was passed, anyone caught and convicted of making or passing the fake continental currency would be automatically sentenced to death. In 1780, Congress even took the extra step of offering a bounty on counterfeiters and they offered $2,000 in the present continental currency to any person or persons who take and prosecute to conviction. And now that reward of 2,000 continental dollars was worth about $10 backed by specie at the time. Despite the fact that at one point, the amount of counterfeit currency in circulation may have actually exceeded the amount of legitimate currency in circulation, the economy never fully collapsed. Another sign that shows the, just shows the extent of British counterfeiting was that the issues of legitimate continentals that were issued between May 20th, 1777 and April 11th, 1778, so just about a year's worth of printing, became so widely counterfeited that Congress eventually decided it was just easier and necessary to recall all issues in their entirety. 
Now seen here is an example of the intricate nature of some of the designs used by printers to discourage counterfeits. Intricate designs, such as the floral leaf pattern we see here, were incorporated into the design of Continentals to deter counterfeiting because it made them harder to reproduce. Continentals also featured intricate borders, which we can see here as well, and would sometimes even include the phrase, tis death to counterfeit, to serve as a warning and hopefully a deterrent for would-be counterfeiters. Now, continental currency also features several different designs. And while we don't unfortunately have time to discuss them all, we are going to look at one of the most commonly recognized ones. Several of the images found on continental currency were actually designed by Benjamin Franklin, who, as we mentioned earlier, prior to the war, had worked with partners in his printing shop. And they created intricate prints of a variety of designs. One of the most recognizable design features what is known as the We Are One design. Now, one of the reasons British leaders thought the American colonies would never rebel, and if they did succeed in the war, never survive, was because the colonies were too diversely settled, and they produced different products and thus offer, operated on different economies. But the period of non-importation had taught the American people that they could be self-sustaining if they worked together. And this is the meaning behind Franklin's design, which we see here. And although it is a little faded, we can see that in the center of the design, it reads, we are one, surrounded by the word American Go Congress, excuse me. And surrounding that small circle are interlocking, interlocking circles forming a larger circle. Each of those smaller circles represents a colony, which you can see has its name included, which allows each colony its own identity while creating a visual impression of unification, indicating that the colonies are one. Now on the reverse side of the bill, featuring the We Are One design, we often see the Fugio image. This was also designed by Benjamin Franklin, and this image features a design of the sun shining down on a sundial, which is a symbol for the measure of time. And on the connecting lines is written Fugio, meaning I flee or I fly, to remind viewers that time flies. It also features the phrase, which is a little hard to read because we can see the bill was folded at a period of time, but right underneath that sundial, we can see the word um, business. And so kind of in that crease that we unfortunately can't see too much of, it actually reads, mind your business, implying that no American should misuse their time or do anything unessential to the task of securing American economic freedom from Britain. We can also see at the bottom of this, one of those hand signatures, handwritten signatures that were on continentals. And of course, this also gives us an example of the intricate borders that we would see. And as we mentioned before, despite Congress printing paper money, the individual colonies were also printing their own money, which contributed to the continentals rapid deflation. Seen here is an example of a bill printed in Massachusetts. The design, which was known as the sword in hand design, depicts a colonial soldier with a sword in his right hand and a copy of the Magna Carta in the left. And of course, the Magna Carta is the um, British legal document. Above the motto is, and it is a little faded, but reads, Issued in Defense of American Liberty. And below is the motto of Massachusetts, which is in Latin, but the Latin translates to, By the sword, one seeks peace under tranquil liberty. And this bill was printed in 1775. We can see down at the bottom, December 7th, 1775. And this was actually designed by Paul Revere. And as we can see from the top, was worth 42 shillings. In January of 1777, about $1 and about $1.25 of continental currency 
could purchase approximately $1 in specie, which remember is gold and silver coin. However, by the end of 1778, so about two years, Continentals had retained only a fifth to a seventh of their original face value. By 1780, so again, two more years, the bills were worth about 1 40th of their face value. And by January of 1781, it took $100 in Continentals to obtain just $1 of hard specie. This depreciation had effectively put an end to the circulation of these paper bills by 1779, and by May of 1781, Continentals had become so worthless that they ceased to circulate as money. When the Continental dollar failed, it left the young nation saddled with a very hefty war debt, and of course, as you can imagine, an unstable currency. The deep economic depression that followed the Treaty of Paris in 1783 and fear of further economic chaos played a significant role in the decision of the American government to ultimately abandon the Articles of Confederation for the more powerful centralized government that was created by the federal constitution. The experience of inflation and the collapse of the continental dollar also prompted the delegates of the Constitutional Convention to include the gold and silver clause into the United States Constitution so that the individual states could not issue bills of credits or make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. Following the ratification of the Constitution, Continentals could be exchanged for Treasury bonds at just 1% of their face value. Thank you guys so much for attending this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a little something about continental currency as well. If you have any questions about anything you heard today, you can reach out to us on our website at www.historicbeverly.net or email us at research at historicbeverly.net. If you enjoyed today's presentation and would like to continue and support the continued production of our digital content, I strongly encourage you to become a member at the link you can see there on your screen. If you'd like to search for any of the images that you saw in today's collection, please feel free to do so at the link also on your screen and use those numbers that you saw on the images to find what you are looking for. Thanks again for tuning in and we hope to see you at another program soon. Bye-bye.